uh, uh, our webinar today. Uh, next speaker is Dr. David Hughes from Penn State University uh, and founder of Plant Village Platform. David is a, 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 an active and valuable partner of FEO. He uh, cooperated with us uh, establishing a famous and also e-locust for monitoring locust in the latest uh, upsurge in uh, uh, east of Africa and uh, southwest of uh, Asia. So uh, David will talk about his uh, experience in uh, locust and how we can uh, learn lessons from this and apply this for famous or for monitoring uh, fall army war. Uh, also, it's worth to mention that David is serving as the chair of the global uh, technical working group on fall arm war uh, monitoring in the uh, global uh, fall arm war technical uh, committee. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Maggot, and, and thanks very much to the organizing committee for inviting us here to speak about our experiences with eLocust 3M and how that can help us better improve fall army worm monitoring. So um, the fall army worm app famous is, is for both monitoring and an early warning system and initially it was developed at FAO really driven by Keith Kresman and it was a version one and a version two and I joined FAO as a UN fellow and proposed that we use the engine of plant village, uh, which is well established and has had a lot of investment to run famous. And so, so that's what we do. We use plant village to run famous globally. And therefore I want to give an introduction briefly into plant village and then talk about broader lessons. So for those of you who, who know the US system, uh, there's a, a suite of land grant universities which effectively combine research and extension. And so Plant Village is at one of those land grants is at Penn State University. And others that you know about will be say, Ohio State, Purdue, Cornell, UC Davis, et cetera, et cetera. And so these land grants have been very, very effective. So the objective is to put a land grant university in the phone, which is essentially what Plant Village is trying to do. So it's a knowledge platform, it's an AI assistant, it's a cloud assistant, collaborative tools for scientists at CJR. It delivers content, content via SMS and TV. It's an SMS platform, experimental plot, and it's, of course, also a proud UN partner. So what Plant Village tries to do is address the, the, the fundamental problem that we have in Africa, which is the, ab the absence of human expertise. So we have two farmers here, which are very representative of the ones that we work with. Uh, we work with about 83% women farmers. Rosalind is the foreground. Emiliana is in the, in the background. And Rosalind is a lead farmer to whom we give a smartphone. And then she goes around with this smartphone helping her neighbors like Emiliana. And inside this phone is, a, is an AI assistant, works offline. And that AI assistant is twice as good as extension officers in Kenya and Tanzania, as measured by IITA. And so this means that she can go from farm to farm and help her neighbors and, and simply have an expert in her hand, which is excellent. So then she's, we were able to do this for fall army worm. And that's of course how we came to work with FAO on Famous. So it's not just technology, of course, it's also a system whereby we have to backstop with this group of young people that we call the dream team. And I'll come on to those repeatedly throughout the talk, but our great challenge is how do we provide these advanced tools to communities where 100% of the members are less than $2.50 a day or, or, or predominantly older individuals over the age of 50, 55, and as I said, 83% women. And so that's a great challenge which has to be met through, through cooperative uh, associations, uh, through table banking, through women groups, and through this dream team that I'll come on to afterwards. So Plant Village has uh, overall uh, eight apps, uh, six Android and two iOS. Famous is one of them. Uh, we have Sousa Hamra for Red Palm Weevil. We have Elocus 3M. We have one we developed for India for Farmer Zone for, for Potatoes. Uh, Plant Village Nuru, the, the main app uh, for climate change and crops. And we have an, a more recent one we're doing with IFPRI for promoting healthy eating for adolescent girls. And all of these apps are tied to our cloud engine, uh, which provides an economy of scale and, and therefore is, a, is extremely beneficial. So let's go into the, the Fall Army Worm app. Uh, how is it doing? So we can look at this 
across time. These are just the activity of the app. There's over 20,000 records. And so one of the things you can notice is it's very episodic. Uh, so we have bursts of activity on the app uh, as time goes by. And this is probably reflecting national programs where we have a lot of energy, a lot of activity, and then those programs kind of dissipate upwards. So we would have liked to have seen, you know, an increase over time. Um, and that's unfortunately not what we're seeing. So that's perhaps one of the warning signals at the moment. The other more serious warning signal is, is a lot of the records that we've been getting on Famous are obviously false. Um, so about 20,000 records at the moment. And what we did here at Penn State is because we're a university and we have access to students, we got 15 students to look at over 19,000 records. So individually looking at them. Now, one of the features that we wanted to have on Famous was uploading of photographs, and uh, particularly because we use AI, so we'd like to check that the AI is correct. But that hasn't been used. A lot of people just went for the manual data entry. And the problem with that is that individuals can be in a town and they can enter data. And, and, and what we did is looked at the database, examined this, and this has really been helped by Derek Moore, one of our engineers on the team, uh, who, who's a who's a database expert. And so we're looking at a lot of these records manually and also through various approaches uh, using Copernicus data. But fundamentally, 61% of the data is marked suspect based upon the fact that it's in a town or it's in a town and it's a 1300 square meter field, which is obviously wrong. And there's, there should be a stop gap here. There should be a way in which we can improve records and countries have actually nominated individuals to look after those records. These are in-country validators. And what we find is that there's often suspect records being accepted. Uh, it varies of course country. Uh, in some places, over 80% of the records like in Zimbabwe have been accepted. In Kenya, it's about 38%. But nonetheless, not a great system. We, we don't have a verifiable a photograph to determine this is indeed fall army worm on a crop uh, and this then therefore leads to records that are are, are not good um, and so so the famous app is fall army worm monitoring and early warning system so in, in the first part the data is wrong um, which is problematic and the second also the data is noisy uh, there's a recent book out by the nobel prize winning economist daniel kahneman with colleagues uh, sipone and sunston and they look at the real problem in judgment and noise. And so we would really like to reduce the amount of noise in the system, as well as, of course, cleaning up the data by ensuring that people do upload photographs. But if all of this data is problematic, then the, the old uh, saying is that if we want to predict uh, something and, and make a model of it, the, the, the old saying is crap in, crap out. So, so this is a huge problem for anybody out there in the community considering to develop predictive models of fall armyworm. Uh, maybe there's another data set that's wonderful and we don't know about it, but at the moment the data is problematic and we all should be really aware of that uh, and be very careful, extraordinarily careful. So, so what can we learn from the desert locust crisis? We really started this back in 2018 with FAO. And, and then of course in 2019, 2020, the crisis kicked off and we learned a lot uh, from this. And I think that's actually gonna improve. So while I painted a somewhat pessimistic uh, situation with Famous, I actually think we're, we're, we can be really optimistic based upon what we learned with locusts. So locust tracking historically has been spearheaded by FAO with country partners relying upon experts like Keith Cressman here and technology, the e-locust suite that, that Keith has been developing over the last many years. And the, the, the records we have are, are rather extensive across the main range from Mauritania to India. And of course, Kenya stands out because it didn't have locusts for 75 years. And then December 28, they came into the country. And if you remember the time uh, back in early uh, early 2020, it was really a, a very nervous time for the Horn of Africa, particularly for, for Kenya, and made worse by the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic was declared on March 11th, which stopped a lot of movement between the country. So it was a crisis within a crisis. And so FAO and Keith particularly asked us to develop a desert local surveillance system tool for non-experts and deploy crisis team. So we had to go from something like Keith Cressman to uh, crowdsource individuals moving across the landscapes on motorbikes. And this has really been spearheaded by Frank Doyle and our team, uh, the lead Android engineer. 
And so young people that we engage were able to connect the satellites via an app that we developed, have offline records, and those records were able to go to the cloud. But we also help those individuals by uh, giving images because, you know, Keith has 30 years experience and Tyson doesn't, just a few days. But we provide images in order to help him make more accurate records. And we also take those records into the cloud and, and, and um, deploy advanced machine learning to recognize the image and give a diagnosis. And this has really been spearheaded by Pete McCloskey, our lead AI engineer, and Rahit Gangupantula, also on the Plant Village team as an engineer, in order to verify the records. And this is really has been really excellent. So let me just kind of switch and show you what, what that looks like. So. Um, So if we look here, we can you can see on the on the platform these are local surveys coming in. Uh, we can see records which have been then confirmed. We have a prediction. This is from Somalia, and you can zoom into that record and you can look at it on the ground and you can see the location where it's gone. And you're also able to notify. You can you can say this is a training record. This is a suspect record. This is a confirmed record. You could change this to something else if you wanted. If you, if it wasn't the right one. And you can also notify the user immediately. And we found that this was extremely useful uh, to the operation of, um, of the eLocus Triam platform. So we have good records in the field, help for the, for the crowdsourcers, but also AI in the cloud and human backup. And this has led to a, a, a database which is 100% accurate, meaning every single record has been identified as being the locus of the right stage, which is really good. The second thing we did in order to kind of steamroll this and move it forward was to take what we had originally, originally done in Plant Village with our dream team and use them to collect as many records as quickly as possible. So Plant Village uses a dream team model where we employ young people who have agricultural degrees, uh, in this case from Moy University, and that's led by our country leader, uh, John Chalal, who's a professor at Moy, and he selects excellent young people, uh, started off at 12, and now we're up to uh, a large number over, over, over 40, and those individuals move across the counties and work with local communities. And so when the locust crisis came, we, we did the same thing, um, and really driven here by uh, Melody and Jeptu on our team and Annalise Keys. So in, in those cases, we got 52 young people from local communities who then go out into the landscape, find locust swarms, critically talk with the pastoralists, get information and relay that back to Earth Ranger, which is a tool that has been used in Kenya to coordinate the airplanes. So, so literally a, a real time communication with airplanes for spraying and this massively reduced the, the problems of locusts. And so what was a crisis within a crisis led to a new model of, of crowdsourcing observations from African youth uh, but enabling them through artificial intelligence and backstopping through a cloud platform. And then that data goes to FAO and then, and then Keith and, and the team make decisions and, and work on downstream predictions. And so as reported by FAO, this was a great success. Uh, the contribution by Plant Village, by Earth Ranger, Vulcan, and of course the, the broader efforts of the Desert Locus Information Service led by Keith. And, and then the outcome was food safe for 34 million people in 2020 at a value of 1.5 billion. So it can work. And, and we got a very nice shout out by, the, by, by Kip Tom uh, talking about the importance of bringing this integrative knowledge, particularly from, uh, we're of course biased, but particularly from uh, land grant universities, where we can take excellence in artificial intelligence and excellence in agronomy, put those together in the service of FAO. So when we then fly it under flag, it is a dynamite uh, combination, we think. So, so what are the lessons that we can learn for famous from eLocus 3M? Well, the first and most important and critical is verifiable data. It must have a photograph. We've all gone through COVID. We all, we all understand the importance of verifiable data. We need to have, in COVID, you must have a sequence on GenBank, otherwise it doesn't count. In, in the case of transboundary pests or even pests within a country, we must have a photograph. Uh, otherwise, we can't verify that it is pest A, B, or C. That's critically important. And even then there can be some problems around noise, around bias. And so we must have clean data. So we must have a system where we have humans cleaning the data alongside AI and then domain experts uh, like Keith, who can then say, well, I think there's still a problem because of his experience. I think that's really, really critical. Um, so those are 
critically important lessons that we can take away from all of this. In preparing for this talk, uh, Buyang talked about the steering committee questions, which I thought were really excellent. And there are three of them. So what are the costs and benefits of Plant Village running famous? Um, how will outcomes reach the end user and how does it improve our ability to control? So I wanna to touch on that. So let's talk about costs. So, so why should a, a, an outfit like Plant Village run a system or, or why should we have famous in, in the same way that Remy said we should need it in order to have IPM control at scale? So the costs, of, uh, I, I think, that have really come out of, uh, in developing this uh, presentation is we can have an illusion of success. We can have an app, we can have a map, and we can think we're doing a great job. And that illusion of success can lead to bad predictions, uh, which, of course, is something we absolutely do not want, uh, particularly after a year of COVID, when we understand the importance of predictions and maps and flattening the curve. And I also think, and as, as Remy said, we need IPM at scale. So I think it distracts from the real work. The real work is not a map or monitoring. The real world is like COVID, a vaccination program. In this case, uh, vaccination is IPM. So we need to have uh, these systems. The benefits, uh, the benefits are that we can have multiple apps using the same platform. As I said, we have eight of them. Uh, we've had a lot of investment in Plant Village in 2016, uh, over 4.8 million, and, and that leads to cost savings. So as we get money from the Botner Foundation for IFPRI, uh, for the nutrition app, that helps uh, the eLocus 3M app, and they both help Famous, for example. That's a really critical point to remember. We also get a lot of benefits from being at a university, and we have this network of university researchers as well as CJR researchers that we can tap on. And again, flying the flag for US land grants, I think that's a really important part to pull in. And then we have that dream team and farmer networks that I'll come on to a little bit later. So here's one of the shared benefits that we can get from having lots of projects use the same system. This is our uh, ag tree, agricultural ag algorithmic advice. So we wanna reduce the noise. So we wanna have the right advice going out in the right condition at times. And we're already doing that a little bit through VIPs uh, that we're gonna hear about later on uh, from Bird and, and, and NORAD. But what we can really try to do is, is have systems come in together and then advice going out. So I'll, I'll try and show a demo of this, but what it does is it shows uh, multiple fields that we can we can see and use. And so, um, so here's the, the observatory. I can see there are 1,800 farms that rely upon me. Um, I'll just click on one, and what happens is we can see where the water stress because it automatically pulls in satellite data and chirps data and Copernicus and so on. Uh, we can click on Donna, for example, here. Um, and we can look at a field that we can see how many are good in terms of water. This is an automatic system that's pulling in data um, and disease records, which is which is amalgamated from the app or can also be from models that we develop or activity. So who, who needs to get a ping in, in terms of doing more? And we can actually ping this farmers directly via SMS from this system. And so if we click on uh, here, we, we would see the, the, the stress data and we could also examine the photographs that have come in. And again, you know, photographs, 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 that's a really important part. And we can examine them in detail. So, so in this case, you can see there's some frass and you can see the damage. And this might help you determine that this is a relative, maybe a third or fourth instar for sure, but maybe relatively recent because we still see frass. Uh, and these are important uh, information that we can get. So that's the benefit of, of this. And then when, when rules have been created, say by a domain expert like Keat, then we can automate those and send them out via SMS at scale. I think that's a really important point. So the other point is that when we have a cloud system, we can pull in data. We pull in data from NASA, from, from SMAP, from um, MODIS, from Landsat, uh, but also CHIRPS data, ECMWF, and so on and so forth. And this helps us look at the stress the crops are growing in. And in East Africa, for example, there's a lot of stress because of the La Nina effects on growth. And these are some... Um, maize that, that we work with in eastern Kenya and Kalifi, and you can't tell whether it's maize or onion. It's, it's just, as John Chalal said, it's just really, really bad. And so we can we can actually gather data automatically from this. So here's a place in Busia, which is relatively well watered. We can look at the effect of rainfall, crop water model. And this is work they're actually doing with uh, the plant protection unit at FAO, including Sandra Corsi, uh, working on a Zambia project. So again, lessons from one place transposed to another. And so we can see that this, this plant is, is healthy, it's happy, it's got, it's got rain, and this one hasn't. And so the ability to tolerate 
fall armyworm is greater here than here. And so we have compounding effects. And I think this is really critical for us all to think about in the coming years, these effects of um, uh, abiotic stress with biotic stressors together. And we can actually convert this to above ground biomass uh, in order to examine how well this is, is growing. And we can even predict the, the future yields coming out of that. And I'll come on to that in a moment. I think that's really critical. So how will we reach the end user? That was the second question the steering committee had. Well, Plant Village recently won a prize for Mercy Corps Agrifin for scaling up uh, the 16 million users during the COVID locust crisis with Shamba Shape Up. And so it really demonstrates that, again, a lesson from, from locust, we can actually operate at scale. And we currently reach 500,000 farmers via text messaging uh, on climate smart adaptations and pest advice with Media and Ishamba. And we plan to get to 2 million by the end of 2020. Uh, we also got a prize from uh, Mercy Corps for that. Uh, we're working with NORAD from Malawi Country Portal and working with ECOWAS uh, via WAVE. So that's a, another point. So we, we have the ability in Plant Village to reach users with advice. How does it improve our ability to control things? I think that's really critical. There was excellent talks by Red Harrison, Ivan Cruz, and, and Sevgan Zubramani a few weeks ago, and I really encourage you to watch that. And as Remy said, it's all about IPM, it's all about control. So we've been working very closely with uh, ICIPE, um, and this is some work that, that Faye put together in, in collaboration with the Dream Team, where we released egg parasitoids, two of them, onto fields, and we actually released them a little bit late, so we could even do this better. But you can look at the difference, only, it's very preliminary, but seven fields that we looked at, this is the field with the parasitoids, this is the field without the parasitoids, a 38% difference, absolutely massive change, really, really impactful. Um, and so we do this by, this is satellite data on above ground biomass through Whopper, an FAO tool, uh, and very, very useful way. And this, this is highly correlated with the yields, and. They're still growing these fields, so we'll actually get yields in a couple of weeks' time, and we can report that back to anybody who's interested. But parasitoids make a huge difference. Essentially, it's a vaccine program uh, for, for, for maize. As plant village has come, I have spent nothing. The much I, I would have used to buy pesticides, I've used to progress my mess, and I have also used some amount to do with it. So I thank the organization very much, and I urge my fellow farmers to use natural means to, to, to give this army one instead of using a lot of money because it has no effect the environment or no side effects. So I thank the organization very much. Thank you very much. So, so, so obviously for us, farmers are front and center. So Emily is, is not only getting 38% or 40% more yield, she's saving $75 per season that she can use on, on fertilizer. So it's a huge win uh, and something we want to scale up. We did this in the long range so we really want to go at scale uh, for the short rains next season. So please contact us if you want to be involved with that and we'll continue our excellent work with Sipi on this. So the other part is that how do we get farmers like Emily? So we work with lead farmers, as we mentioned, how do we get Emily to, to, to share that knowledge? So, so work by Meda Upala, who's a sociologist and statistician, is trying to understand this network dynamics. And as I said, we work with farmer groups, women groups, 83% women, and we wanna cascade it because we need to get this information out and they're gonna believe other farmers before they believe researchers. So that's a critical aspect of spreading parasitoid and IPM knowledge generally through the networks. So in conclusion, let's go back to Rosalind where we, we first started in her field. Um, in conclusion, we need a systems approach. Yes, she needs famous and she needs apps and she needs a, a phone, but she also needs the dream team, the network of following farmers, push pull, parasitoids, even bioherbicides for Striga, and the data that comes from the cloud system that we provide. So we really want the whole systems approach. And, and the other message again for a third time is photos, photos, photos. We need to have verifiable data. Models, any models of, of fall army worm, uh, climate change, whatever it is, they have to be transparent. We have to be able to see underneath the hood. We, we can't think, we, want, we wouldn't accept non-transparency for, for, for uh, vaccines or for models of COVID. Why should we ex ex accept them for 
how farmers adapt to pests and climate change. And so essentially thinking about COVID, we need to vaccinate farms against fall army war with parasitoids and push pull. ICIPI has done excellent work, Red Harrison, many, many people have uh, Ivan Cruz, lessons from Brazil. So we really need to take those and go at scale. I think that's really the critical finding. So I won't go through my acknowledgements here. There's a lot of them, but I'll just leave up a, an advertisement for why we should invest in, in, in African youth. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for uh, this uh, very good presentation. Uh, I think it's very informative and thank us for uh, uh, spotting the weakness point also of, of famous because this is the only way to improve it. And uh, I see it's unfair to compare uh, Fall Army Worm with Desert Locust because uh, we have 70 years of experience with Desert Locust comparing with only five or four. Uh, uh,